Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 306 for Tuesday, June 1st, 2021. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire, where seasonal allergies are at their peak. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Napomo, California, where I thought it was supposed to be summer, but it's not. Paul Kent. <laughs> yeah, we had um, we, we Memorial Day weekend just happened, and it was like 90s all last week, and then rained like crazy Friday, Saturday, and half of Monday. And it was in like the 50s and 60s. And now today it's back in the 70s and it'll be in the 90s the rest of the week. So that's fun. So I drove up to the Bay Area uh, for a gig on Sunday and I played in 90 degree weather. As right. I drove down south, uh, I got to Paso Robles about two hours south. And it was it was 82 at 730 at night. And then you go down this big grade to come into San Luis Obispo area. And it was 54 degrees. Oh, whoa. <laughs> so that much okay. of a swing, 200 miles. So, yeah, I mean, they, they told us that um, May and June, you get a lot of weather coming off the ocean and, and you know, it's cooler. It's foggy in the morning, foggy, you know, late afternoon. Sure. And it's just cooler, which is not what I'm used to. And especially when I see it's 90, you know, up where I used to be. So, but the flip side of this, we moved here in August. And from August until the middle of January, it was ridiculously nice weather. So it's just a little bit of a shift. That's good. But yeah. you know, when you're ready, when you're, when you're ready for it to start to be summer, you're ready for it to start to be summer. It's true. And we, yeah, we, that's what we had last week and a half or whatever was just like, Oh, it's here we are summer, which is super early for us to have like 90 degree weather in, in May uh, here in New Hampshire. But, um, but then this weekend was like, okay, here's the, the rain that we're supposed to get in the spring, which, which yep. kind of sucked for Memorial Day weekend. But, you know, it was fine. I actually got one gig in this weekend with, uh, with the Amanda Dane Band. We had a gig scheduled last night. So Monday evening, we were supposed to play six to nine. Um, and, uh, and they canceled everything the day before because it was just a total washout. It was this new... Uh, shopping outdoor center thing with like a brewery and an LL bean. And then like a, a restaurant that's not a chain, but sort of a local presence here in New Hampshire is Tuscan market thing. And uh, it was weird. I mean, it was like, it, it was nice. I mean, it was like a beautiful stage and, but it was all like fake grass and the little nuclear families everywhere. It was this very sort of <laughs> Edward Scissorhands sort of fabricated environment. Yeah. 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 But it was fine. Like it was, it was, it was just like, I could be our, our guitar player turned to me and he's like, I could be anywhere right now. Like there's nothing, you know, that, that says that I'm in Salem, New Hampshire at this moment in time. And, um, but it was fine. Like it was, you know, very nice. As I I've think. been meaning to ask you, are you in that band now? Yeah, I mean, I've been playing with Amanda on and off for uh, whatever since she started doing gigs. What, whatever. But that's that what I'm was saying. On and off. Are, are you are you on in like a first call type of way? I am an on in a first call type of way now. Yes, that's right. She there's basically two drummers that work with her. There's me, and then there's uh, Derek Swenson. And uh, Derek just had a he and his wife just had a baby, and so uh, and and. Like I'm sure everybody's going to love me telling all these stories here, but um, is she and uh, Amanda and Derek dated years ago, and and so that's you know created a, a at for a moment that created a weird vibe like when they broke up, but now they're fine. Like you know he's he's been playing with her, and I had to turn down a bunch of gigs last summer, and so he became first call, and then uh, and then with his baby coming in. You know, she called me, I don't know, a couple months ago and was like, hey, are you mm. available this summer? Like, is there any chance you can play some gigs with me? And I'm like, actually, yeah, that'd be great. And and it's covers or original music? Amanda is at the moment all covers, um, okay. but she knows that like that, that she would make more money if she had originals, you know. And so yeah. she just sent you a song list and that band has, doesn't rehearse, right? <laughs> sent me a song list. That's interesting. If you count yelling out songs in the middle of the gig to, t to let me know what's <laughs> next as a song list. No, she did actually text us a song list. I got it a full hour before I had to leave for the gig yesterday. So I was super prepared. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it worked out great. We played outdoors and 
uh, we did our own sound, which was fine, but everybody in that band can play, you know, um, the, the, the primary guitar player is this guy named CJ Lewis, who great singer and fantastic guitar player. Um, and then Joe Harding plays bass and he's just a monster. It's a pleasure playing music with those people. So, so yeah. And again, I, she's well known enough that she kind of has her choice of kind of like, you know, first rate players. Yeah. 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 That, I guess so. Sure. I mean, she's found a, she's found a group of players. There's two drummers, two guitar players and two bass players that, that she kind of has in her circle. And, um, and so it, you know, it works out. Um, it, it's similar to the Kelly band that I was in 15 years ago in that regard, that there's kind of a, you know, I don't feel terrible if I have to say, no, I can't do that gig. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, cause they, I mean, we've had, you know, the bitter pill stuff, is generally my first priority these days. And so, and we've got lots of gigs booked this summer. So there's been plenty with Amanda that I've had to turn down. And, um, but Derek's able to cover a few here and there, which is good. So, mm -hmm. so, but it's, you know, it was, um, it worked out fine. They called us at like three in the afternoon and we're like, Hey, can you start by five instead of six? We, we didn't realize that it was going to be so nice here and there were going to be people here. So we, we went down early and started a little early and uh, oh, nice. it was good. I, um, I, you know, I'm always looking for like gear and deals because I'm, I'm a musician and it's what we do. And I've noticed it at, especially these Amanda gigs, but even like, and our, and our bitter pill gigs, that none of the guitar players that I play with have good like mics for their amps. And so I started looking and, and there's sort of the classic, the Sennheiser E906, which is the, the, um, microphone that you often see just sort of hung down over a guitar cabinet. It's a little rectangular microphone. The element is on one of the flat sides of it. So you can just hang it right in front of it. You don't even need a stand if you don't want to have one. And it, you know, it, it sounds great. It's got a three-way switch on it. So you can, uh, either roll up the high end or roll down the high end and they sound great. And they're about 200 bucks. So I'm not terribly expensive, but you know, 200 bucks is 200 bucks. Well, Behringer makes the B906 uh, microphone. And that's at, at this very moment is uh, like $56 and change on Amazon. And so I found a video online. I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, this might be like, I don't know that I want to spend 200 bucks just so I can have a good mic for a guitar player on some of the gigs I play, but I'll spend 56 bucks for that. And uh, <laughs> so I found a video online of this guy which I'll put in the show notes, this guy comparing the two microphones. And what he did was he recorded his electric guitar into his looper. So it was literally the same thing being played out of his amp, it, you know, same, uh -huh. same a pick attack, same everything. Cause it was in his looper. And then he recorded it actually with three microphones. We heard it coming out of his amp into his iPhones microphone. Cause that's what he was doing. And then he also looped it through each of these mics, um, uh, and in, you know, it's like a 90 second video and it explains everything and you can hear, you know, he points out a mild high end presence difference that exists in the Sennheiser that does not exist in the Behringer, but for, you know, four for the price of one, that difference goes away <laughs> real fast, especially when you're just using, I mean, if I was running a, a class, a recording studio here, I don't think I would, I would go with the, you know, the less expensive sort of off brand thing. It, it means something to show the people that are coming in and paying you, you know, whatever they're paying you that you're using, you know, industry standard mics, I guess I, an argument could be made, but you know, uh, for hanging it over an amp at a gig, man, four for the price of one is exactly the right price. And so I've used, I used it last night on the gig on CJ's amp. And it sounded fantastic. I used it at a fling rehearsal last week over Mike's amp just to get a feel for it. It's got the three-way roll-off switch on it. And so, uh, you know, so we tried it three different ways with Mike's amp. And it was obvious that just like we do with Russ's, Russ and Mike both own E906s from Sennheiser. And so right. it was really nice to be able to compare. And, and we do the same thing. We roll off the high end on both of them. And uh, and it sounds great live. Like it, it gets the tone of the guitar. It gets what you want. Amazing. Yep, it off axis. Rejection. I really think we you know, so. we kind of hinted at this a little while ago. There's something going on in in the music industry in in which uh, there are low cost options to many things that are not just a little bit low cost, but ridiculously low cost. There's there's a brand of guitars out there called Firefly, and I'm guessing every guitar player out there has probably seen what's going on with this and raising their eyes, right? 
Right. They make they make these knockoff uh, three thirty Gibson three thirty fives, mm. Chinese made. Um, they seem to have long runs of unusually high quality uh, uh, production, and then they have some weird production problems. Um, they're selling a lot of guitars. They sell them through Amazon. They have some distributor called Guitar Garden. My point to all this is that a three thirty five is about a thirty five hundred dollar guitar. These guitars are under two hundred dollars. Yes, yeah, right? that's the thing, man. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when you, when I kind of see these things about, you know, what is possible, we're seeing like really decent digital mixers, right? Oh, yeah. That are way less than the industry standard. So for the prosumer, the weekend warrior, you know, you know, I know in the house records, we love our Midas console, but, you know, what is the Behringer equivalent of the Midas console well, so that, for the features that you're giving up, right? That's an interesting thing, right? Because Behringer acquired Midas. So the, the, right. the X30, the, the, asterisk 32 series, which with Behringer is the X32 with Midas is the M32 share a lot of the same technology. I'll say not all the Midas one has better preamps. There's some different routing that you can do between the two of them, but the apps all work the same with them. And again, you're right for a, a generally a live mix. The Behringer console is, is going to be fine for you as compared to the Midas one. Those preamps on the Midas one are nice. I will say that, but like it, it, there is an audible difference. If you have someone mixing that knows how to, in, how to take that difference out, but, uh, or to make that difference heard. But, um, but yeah, yeah, no, it's it Behringer, you know, like Behringer kind of reminds me of Monoprice in, in my, my tech life. Although Monoprice definitely makes products for musicians too where they they look at what's successful and they I don't want to use the word reverse engineer because that might imply things that they're not doing I don't know but it's kind of like they've figured out what the important parts of the guts are and then what the not important parts are and then build the thing with the important parts and make it a lot cheaper and that's why yeah. I've got a mono price display in front of me here at my desk it's why I bought that Behringer microphone you know I, like it's yeah yeah, it's interesting. Yep, it is interesting. And like I said, it just makes you think about the the dollar value you assign to any kind of brand. I mean, if you like just this this Behringer versus Sennheiser conversation, yeah. 4X is crazy, right? Yeah, now, I just looked. The, the Sennheiser mic, at least on Amazon, is on sale. Instead of being $199, which it was last week, today it's $129. So, you know, we're still at 2.5X. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or maybe two X, I guess. But, yeah. uh, but you know, so yeah, but for two X, four X, like either way, I'm, I'm going to buy two of the Behringer's. Now, if worse came to worse on a gig and it turns out that this Behringer mic isn't, uh, you know, has reliability problems or something. I mean, I haven't heard any of that. All the reviews say that it's great, but you know, I do have backups, right? So you got to think about that. There was a time maybe 20 years ago where I would not touch anything that had a Behringer power amp in it. That's the, right. Right. Their mixers were great that, you know, yeah. their, their solid state stuff that was sort of not a power amp was, was great, but their power amps were like, you know, 50% failure rate. And it was like, yeah, that's not for me at a gig. Thanks very much. Right. But yeah, I think, I, I think probably about 20 years ago, I had a Behringer mixer that just died. So I, mm. I would say, it seems as though something happened with Behringer. Definitely. Where either new management or, you know, a refreshed view of the world. And um, they have addressed quality tremendously while maintaining price. And, you know, a larger strategy of things like, you know, being involved with Midas and, you know, yeah. kind of stratifying their product line is just really interesting. But I wouldn't stay away from Behringer products. Oh, now. no. No, I've I've been very happy with with all the different Behringer stuff that I've used uh, over the especially over the last you know two decades or whatever. Yeah, yeah. it's been great. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, I wanted to, actually wait, real hey, quick. I wanted to tell you about you. You know, go ahead. Like, go ahead. No, no, I was gonna I was like, gonna talk about our sponsor, but but let's talk about your thing. Then we'll talk about our sponsor. No, let, then we'll talk about another thing. No, let's please talk about our sponsor because I want to tell you a little bit about uh, my gigs from this past weekend and some interesting things going on. All right. Hey, do you dread looking at your credit card statement every month? We don't blame you. Nobody likes looking at that, right? Good news. Our sponsor, Upstart, can lift that weight off your shoulders so that you can finally feel the relief of being free of credit card debt. Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan. And what's cool is they do it all online. 
What's really cool is that unlike other lenders, Upstart looks at more than just your credit score. They look at things like your income and employment history, and this means that they can offer smarter rates with their trusted partners. So whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, you know, because we like to buy gear as musicians here, over half a million people have used Upstart to get a simple fixed monthly payment. And you can do their five-minute online rate check so that you can see your rate up front for loans between $1,000 and $50,000. And you can receive your funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today by going to upstart.com slash giggab. That's upstart.com slash giggab. And don't forget to use our URL, which is G-I-G-G-A-B, to let them know that we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based upon your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Again, that's upstart.com slash giggab. And our thanks to Upstart for sponsoring this episode. All right. You were saying, my friend. <laughs> yes, I'm saying. Um, so a couple of interesting things for my gigs. One is my Sunday gig. I went up to the Bay Area. Beautiful day. Nice crowd. Um I tried a Sinatra song and it went over really, really well. So Ooh. talk about, you know, getting out of your wheelhouse and talk about, and the thing is we had a conversation a couple episodes ago about uniqueness and repertoire. And you and I were on slightly different pages about this. You know, you were a little bit more of the, listen, the songs are out there. Anybody can cover them and you don't own them. And and I, while I, I get that you don't own them, I still strive to play stuff that nobody else is playing. That's fair. Um, you sure. know, I still I still want, you know, when people come to see me for it to be a different experience. Now, me and my little circle of friends who are getting a lot of the acoustic gigs there, everybody plays, you know, Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. Just about everybody plays Sweet Melissa by uh, by the Almond Brothers. They're like classic acoustic songs, right? But I, I just think, you know, we're also sharing kind of a – an audience base of people kind of follow all of us and, you know, go to, go to music gigs every day of the week. And so I'm always looking for things that can be uh, different. So um, I, I pulled out the way you look tonight, nice jazz arrangement, you know, a little stretch for my guitar chops as well. And I just saw that look like, yes, this is something different. This is something new. And I, you know, selfishly, I think that's good. I want, I want when people come to see me for there to be, you know, I'm playing in the area you know, six, eight, 10 times a month, right? Right. What's going to make someone think to see me twice in a month other than friendship, right? And and I really don't want to bank on, you know, an obligation or friendship for people to come see me. I want my show to be interesting. So, you know, I kind of have my little niche where I do a lot of Springsteen. You know, I'm probably one of the only people that does that much Springsteen. Sure. Um, you know, Simon has his niche where he does a lot of 80s uh, covers, acoustic covers, does a fantastic job with it. Mary Ellen and Tom, you know, kind of have their niche of, you know, female yeah. material. But, I'm, you know, when I work hard and find a song and then bring it in and, you know, play it, and then I see it played by other people in the next week, yeah, they can do it. It just, you know, it's like, uh, you know, everybody should want to be unique. Everybody should want to strive and make this scene vibrant by having your own little carved out niche. And so I pulled out this Sinatra song, which was kind of cool. Uh, it got a really good reaction and, um, uh, you know, tip jar started ringing and all sorts of things. So it was pretty cool. So that's one thing. Now, here's the interesting one. I've developed a regular gig down here where I'm living. The venue owner at first had said, you know, we would like blues music and no country. And I said, well, I don't really do blues. Here's here's my repertoire, singer, songwriter, classic rock, a little bit of classic country, that type sure. of thing. Sure. And they said, oh, okay. And I think that they were, they were just trying to start getting, you know, their, their stable of, of performers. And as time has gone on, you know, they've let me know we really want it to be all blues. And so I, you know, I'm presented with a choice. I can say, thank you, but no, I don't do that. You know, you can, you can ask for whatever you want. And it's your right. It's your venue, that type of, course. of thing. Yeah, sure. And you cannot book me if I don't have it, right? But I actually thought about it. I was like, you know, I have probably... I have probably an hour of blues and, you know, for me to learn another hour, hour 15 of blues, you know, standard type things. Um, I personally don't think a guy playing Lightning Hopkins for, you know, three hours is going to be the most, the most stimulating thing for people if they're going to listen for three hours. Especially an acoustic gig. 
like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like a small trio would be cool. Would but, be great. But, um, right. Yeah. But to play that, you know, like, you know, original Muddy Water stuff, you know, original Robert Johnson stuff, I don't know if there's three hours of entertainment there, but that's what they want. And so I said, you know, in for a dime, in for a dollar, you know, I, I'll take the challenge. And so I'm starting to dig in and put together a book, basically. And so it's that it was but it was that interesting moment of pause between, nope, I'm selling what I do, which is this is my show versus, yeah. you know what, I'm a guitar player and a singer. You know, there's no reason I couldn't have a book of of blues, and it's a good steady gig, and they're cool people, and you know it's worth it's worth the effort to develop the show. Ostensibly, that I'll, I'll play mostly just for them, but yeah, but you might um, you might find half a dozen tunes that work for right. you, right? That that spill over into other gigs and things like that. I mean, because you yeah. can add like there's some Stevie Ray Vaughan tunes that'll work, like Pride and Joy will work well. Um, uh, as an acoustic kind of thing. I mean, it, it's not necessarily the easiest song to sing. And that's the trick with a lot of those, right? Like the Stevie Ray Vaughan and the Clapton and those sorts of things are like, like those guys can sing. Like that's, that, I, I've had guitar players bring those into bands before. And it's like, yeah. who's, who's going to like, let's not forget why this song was popular. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. The guy can play guitar. Sure. But also but there's a song. There's yeah. a song that is sung. I mean, those guys can sing. So I'm always, you know, I'm always really cognizant of that. Bringing those well, we've had that conversation about the yeah, blues, right? For sure. You know, that yeah. that many towns have a blues scene. And I argue that ostensibly they have a blues scene because the barrier to entry to simple blues and, you know, being able to get up on stage into a blues jam, you know, is, is you know, pretty low right. often. Right? It, it can, I'm sure. 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 Yeah. Right. The, the 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 basic functional concept of a twelve bar blues is, you know, not beyond the reach of one of the many first players. things that you do when you first jam with people, you know, in your musical endeavors and career. That's right. Right. It makes me somewhat crazy because I think what you end up with is a lot of bad blues. And you know what? Well, without this, question. This is an art form. <laughs> yeah. This is an art form, you know, you could say a uniquely American art form, you know, that there is tons of history and nuance and culture and stuff that makes the blues, the blues. And sometimes it's, it's hard to see what people do to the blues. Yeah. But, I finally you know. learned how to play the blues, like at a point where I would feel confident saying that I could be a blues drummer about two years after I moved out of Austin and left that blues band that I was in for six years. So I, I, you know, I called the guys and apologized to them and thanked them for, you know, letting me be in the band with them. But I mean, it takes a long time to get to the point where you're like, ah, I'm starting to get it now. And we played, you know, four times a month in that blues. Yeah. Band. It took a while to get to the, I mean, I thought I had it back then. And then it was after the fact, it was like, Oh, well, it's deceptive yeah. and it's often yeah. simplicity, right? I mean, it yeah. is so much, all same music with, is same feel, with playing right? Country music, right? Same kind of well, thing. Well, all music is feel, right? I mean, you have to inhabit the music to, in order to really play it. I would argue that there's, the blues is uniquely something that you have to inhabit in order to, in, to emote it well. I think so. And, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Con but so. country is like, I, I had the same experience learning to play country music. Like mm -hmm. I thought it was super easy. And, and, you know, on paper, similar to the blues, it's like, you're right. There's this functional thing that you can do and now you're playing country, but you're not actually playing country, right? Like right. there's a feel to it, even though everything is super simple and you're not overplaying, you know, you're playing a lot of just, you know, straight beats and things like that. That feel is like not easy to get down for sure. Well, feel. Yeah. Yeah, I think often about times when I've brought covers that I am passionate about, but they're a little obscure, right? And that's the thing is the guys are playing the right notes, but it doesn't feel right. And it makes me crazy. Like I, like, I think I told you when I first started the House Rockers, I thought there would be value in uh, playing the East Coast music that I grew up with and loved so much, right? Sure. And I put together a band, you know, five piece, five piece horn section, had the charts written, and gave everybody the songs to learn and we played it and it would just would make me absolutely crazy. The little pauses, the little breaths, you know, the little emphasis, the little breaks, the, you know, all this type of stuff, which is what I love about the music. Yep. And when you don't hear that back when you're trying to emote, uh, you know, a song that means a lot to you. And this is one of the hard things about, you know, I think about bands and in, 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 it's a, um, a band is an exercise in compromise, right? Like everybody's, yes. you know, 
contributing songs that type of stuff. But in that compromise, I would um, I would say that the the bands that respect each other enough, where the, where the players pay unique attention to get after the thing that the guy who brought the song in is looking for, I think that's those are successful bands, and where it's all done mutually, right? Yeah. Where, you know, where, where still, I, I care as much about your songs as you care about my songs. It, it, yes. I mean, that's super important. Uh, it, and, and really I, I like to be in a band where that's table stakes. It's not mandatory, but th like, that's a great, to me that, to me, that is table stakes that everybody's going to respect what's going on and what other people are bringing in, even if it's not your thing. Mm -hmm. But even then, even with that respect level, I, you know, if, the people that you're playing with don't know that music like you do. It, they're never going to get it a hundred percent the way you right. hear it. And I, and I've been in those scenarios. I've talked many times on this show about trying to play, you know, Burke brings in a grateful dead tune into right. fling or something. And it's like, you know, we're playing it the, the best that the five of us can play it, but it, we are never going to play it like the grateful dead. And four of the five of us have not immersed ourselves in the dead in the way that one of the five of us has. And so if you're hearing the dead play it in your head, you're, you're going to be frustrated by what's actually being played in the room, right? Like you got to let go of that. And, and I learned that a long time ago with, with cover bands. And I think I, you know, I've always attributed this to being a prog rock snob, you know, growing up where it was like, okay, well, I know that, no band I ever play in is going to sound like Rush. No band mm. I ever play in is going to sound like Yes, because no band sounds like them except them. That you know, even a good like Rush tribute band or a Yes tribute band, they don't sound like Rush or Yes. They play the music as a tribute, right? There's two, there's a difference, and it's okay. Uh, they play it well, but they don't. I mean, who's going to sound like Getty Lee? Who's going to, you know, who's going to sound like Neil Peart, right? Uh, or or Lifeson? It's just not going to happen. Much less, get, much less get three people who all sound like them, who all right? sound. It's just not going to happen, right? And yeah. so, I, you know, I, I guess because of that, it, this was very evident to me early, early on. But a lot of people don't, you know, didn't go through that. I guess, and and so it. I always feel so bad when I'm in that scenario and somebody's super frustrated, like you're talking about here, you know, with, with, you know, you're not breathing the music the same way I am. Right. Well, that's, that's going to be true. And I always feel really bad, but I, I also can't like change myself in the moment. Well, you can't fix it. You can't, it's unfixable. It, yeah. You have to just accept that this is how these five people or these 10 people play that song. And if you don't like it, that's okay. Scrap yeah. it from the set list. Yeah. Right. Just scratch it. But don't keep trying to play the version you're hearing in your head when that's not what's coming out. You, yeah. you know, you got to you you need to apply that filter to it. Like, it, do I like this? No. OK, well, then I don't want to learn to hate this song that I've loved my whole life. So I'm just not going to play it in this band. Mm -hmm. It's OK. No problem. Moving on. Yeah. yeah. But that's not easy. Like, you, you know, if you have your heart set on something, it's like, yeah, you know. We can't all play rock band in our rock bands. You know what I mean? That's right. I do know what you mean. <laughs> um, and actually, it's a harder lesson because when yeah. you start, you know, you have this thing that you love so much and it's driving you to play and, you know, get people together to play. And then when it just doesn't quite feel the same, at, le at least for me. I mean, I think some people just like to play. Yeah. Um, but for me, there were, I was picking some really special songs to me and it was making me nuts. I mean, I was like, the horn chart's written why doesn't it sound exactly like that horn section? And you know, because it's not that horn Guess section. Guess what? It's not that horn section. You know, yeah. I've, I, as we're having this conversation, I realized that there is no difference here between cover bands and original bands in this, in this way. Because if I'm working with some, with a songwriter and that person is, you know, only wants the song exactly the way they hear it in their head, unless they've written it, knowing how I play, which definitely has happened over the years. I mean, that's sort of, how original bands work. Uh, but if, unless that's happened, I'm not going to play it like you've heard it in your head. And neither is, you know, the guitar player, the bass player, you know, whoever else you've got in a band. And so it, you, there needs to be the, the, the most successful original projects that I've played in. And I, you know, uh, certainly bitter pill falls into this category. Go figure back in my, uh, go figure in RHA in my college and, and high school days. Hypnotic Clambake was even this way when I was touring with them. 
um, fling is definitely this way is when the person who writes the song writes the song has a vision for it. And that's good, but also is willing to sort of surrender some trust into the musicians that they want to have playing it. And, and knowing that it's going to come out through this filter as this new, beautiful thing. And certainly there are times I've been doing a lot of recording with my friend Jeff, but this happens in all the other projects too. In fact, it's happening with, with fling with one song we're working on right now where I'll play a, a, you know, a take through, right. And, and you know, this is what comes out of me. I hear this song, I play this. And then the, you know, the songwriter, whoever it is, will come to me and be like, all right, so that's cool, which is great for them to say, you know, but it's like, okay, get to the point. And, but yeah, I'm thinking on this one, like on this fling tune that, that we're working on, Russ was like, I really feel like the chorus needs to be like opened up more on the ride. symbol. try like a surf beat or something. And it becomes this collaboration. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, Russ will say, try a surf beat. And then I play it. And he's like, okay, yeah, no, that's bad. You know, or sometimes it will be like, Oh, yep. Wait, that works. And sometimes it's yes, that works too. Right? Like the thing that I did works. The thing that Russ asked for also works. And so if that's what was in Russ's head, we'll go with what was in Russ's head, unless there's some, you know, functional reason or, or, you know, something is just obviously better than the other. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, but, but like that collaboration to me is what makes original bands work, but it's the same kind of collaboration in a cover band where, you know, somebody brings in a tune and it's like, okay, what comes out of this band? All right. You know what? In the chorus, let's try not like maybe instead of having the guitar playing open chords, maybe chunk on one string a little bit just to, to, you know, to tighten it up in the verses and then open it up in the chorus. You, or, produce you know, whatever it is. What's that? You produce each other. You that, produce that's really each the other. Collaborative process. That's correct. It's yes. It's a collaborative process. And I, and I think that needs to happen. I, you know, needs is the wrong word because I'm sure we could come up with an example of a band that doesn't collaborate and it works just fine. But that's the kind of band I like to be in. And that, those are the bands I've found to be the most successful. And this to me is why um, I'm, I have a different view of it. So I'm a bad collaborator. I'm a bad collaborator in life. You know, I'm so <laughs> stubborn on, on the things that I hear in my head and the things that I like. And so that's why I started a band said, I'll do all the work, but you know, you guys are going to have to let me lead, um, which has been, you know, sure. the source of a lot of, interesting journeys. Right. But, um, they may be the, the reason side that, of that is, started. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the flip side of that is I, um, in many projects, I'll be like, I like playing with that guy. He is a good player. He's got good taste. I know I can trust his taste. Just come and bring one and do what you do. Yep. I like those things. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I don't want to tell somebody what to play unless it's really important. Uh, and, and in the, and in the, in the vibe of the band that that's what I want. Right. Yeah. So there's, there's, you know, my collaborative process is I choose you because you're freaking cool. You know, come do what you do. Right. That's fun to me. But I, I, I don't like people telling me what to play um, unless I take a gig where that's what the deal is. And, sure. you know, if I've chosen to take that gig, I'm giving myself up to that process. And that's, that's, uh, that's part of the deal. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Well, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, and, and just knowing that going in, like what, what's this vibe going to be and, you know, sorting it out. Yeah. It's good. Exactly. Hey, I um I, I learned some things about ears as as our in ears. My my the journey continues. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we talked about this. Our only, longest running thread. It, well, you know, it's an important one, I, I think. It, it's important to a lot of us. And we talked, we touched on some of this in our uh, interview with Brian Geller last week, which was just fantastic. What an interesting guy. What a great guy. I loved it. Yeah. I just had such a good time with that. Yeah. Um, so I played, I mentioned that. Uh, I played two gigs a week ago, Saturday, where backline was provided, you know, it, it, uh, drums, amps and, uh, you know, and of course, you know, sound both both on stage in front of house and was an engineer yep. and using ears with both of those was interesting. The the first one, I think I talked about this last week where uh, Davis Thurston did the sound and uh, who's somebody I've worked with many, many, many times. And uh, he, I think he knew it was me playing drums in this band, but maybe not uh, no, with Bitter Pill. And I get there and he's like, here's your feed for your ears and here's an iPad for you to mix your ears, which was all set up to the mixer and everything. I didn't have to ask him for a password or anything like that. It was great. Um, and he's like, you know, we'll play half a song for a sound check. Then you can sort of dial it up. And he's like, unless you want me to mix your ears. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's way easier if I mix mine. He's like, yep, that's what I thought. 
And so we did that. But, you know, it was interesting hearing how he EQ'd some things. And uh, and then I went and played with Amanda that night, uh, different club, different sound guy, uh, this guy, Dave Dickinson, who I've also worked with a bunch. And he was the one that did not have the Wi-Fi password for the mixer at uh, at Wally's at the club we played. So he had to mix my ears. And it was, you know, so we had, we, it took us maybe three minutes to discuss, like after we played a song, it was like, okay, I need a lot less guitar. I need a lot more bass, you know, and give me some overheads on the drums and, and we're good to go. But with both of those gigs, um, it basically became a set it and forget it thing. There was no opportunity. I certainly could have tweaked the first gig uh, as we were playing, but where I had put the iPad down, I, it wasn't on my iPad. So I didn't have it like right next to my drums uh, and things were mostly fine in my mix. And so I just let it, let it go. But I think the, the thing that happened at both of those was exactly what Brian Geller was talking about last week, where everybody set their levels and kept their levels at the same spot throughout the set. And that way the ears didn't need to change. The front of house didn't need to change. It was, you know, it was that festival style, that multi-band gig vibe where it's like, right. okay, give the out, give the engineer as great a chance as we can at making us sound good. And, mm -hmm. and that also meant that the ears and the monitors and everything sort of, you know, just worked throughout the gig. And that combined with one other thing, Davis had had bled some reverb into my, you know, sort of default ears mix at that first gig. And it was like, oh, this makes a difference. This helps to sort of mask those minor issues that I might spend the entire gig. Like, is the is the bass too loud? Is the is the vocal just loud enough? You know, like those things that I'm sort of riding back and forth and and trying to decide what is the best adding some reverb in really makes a difference. And I, I never had done that before. You know, it always yells at me when I ask for reverb in my monitor is saying, no, you want to dry, you want to dry. And I, I, I never understood that. I, I, so yesterday when we did uh, that Amanda gig at the, the anywhere USA um, venue, we, um, I, you know, we did our own sound. And so it was my mixer and my ears and all that stuff. And, uh, and I bled reverb in, which I'd never done before. And it was like, oh man, like I've really been missing out. Um, it, it just sort of washed it all together in a really productive way for me. And, and I think that might be part of what might help you too, Paul, which is why I wanted to bring it up. It really made a, it, that whole set it and forget it thing became a lot more possible with, mm. a, a, I would say a fairly healthy amount of reverb in my ears delay. Oh. I don't seem to like in my ears because it it's too, I, I love delay in a monitor wedge, especially on the vocals, right? Like it makes a huge difference because you don't have to be as loud because you're hearing your voice slightly after your voice actually, you make the sound. And so you can hear it better. Delay in the monitor is great. Delay in the mains can be great too, depending on the style of music and all of that. But, um, but having a little reverb in my ears or maybe more than a little reverb in my ears made a huge difference. So I share that. Um, as we, as we progress on this journey together. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have a chance to give it a shot in a couple of weeks. So great. I'll report back. Yeah, please do. Yeah. I'm curious if, if that helps. Um, yeah. My only issue with, with hearing the reverb is I, the way I had my mixer set up, I have one reverb channel that both vocals and anything else were in, which essentially was vocals, acoustic guitar, um, CJ's electric guitar and my snare drum. And I think I had, it turned out, I realized about halfway through the gig, I, I actually brought CJ's guitar down. I was like, wow, it didn't go down as much as I thought. I'm like, Oh wait, I'm hearing more of his guitar via the reverb channel than I am mm. via the, the, like the, the direct guitar channel. And I couldn't change it because that would have affected the reverb in the front of house. You know, it was one reverb mix. And so I'll think about how to, how to approach that at future gigs so that I've got a little bit more uh, control over that. I probably, I probably had too much reverb on him in the front of house is, is really right. what it was, but I didn't want to mess with that halfway through the gig. Um, so I didn't, but, um, but that was the only thing it was like, Oh, I'm getting a lot of that through that through that feed, but uh, you know, it was, it was fine. I mean, it wasn't terrible. It was just like, okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't know. These are the things that I think of. And so I share good things. You're right. Good things. Yeah, man. Yeah. We got anything else for today? 
Um, I'm good for today. We've okay. been on a roll lately. Yeah, man. It's good stuff. Well, we're playing yeah. again a little bit. Like that's yeah. the amazing stuff's part. happening. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we're, we have uh, our semi open rehearsal and then we're, we're doing a secret show. So our, our last, what was scheduled to be a rehearsal where we we're going to run the whole show. Yeah. It's going to be, uh, we got a venue to let us go there. Uh, and, you know, I don't think, I don't think we have too many house rocker fans that listen to this technically, but, um, so there, I've been there seeding, might be more than you think. <laughs> <laughs> I've been seeding clues on the house rocker Facebook page to lead people to understand what's going on. Uh, uh, which is a little weird because now you're reliant on, on Facebook's algorithm to, you know, oh, yeah. put these clues out. And, you know, so again, it's another, it's another social media dilemma in that, you know, when you want to accomplish something, your fans are not your own, according to Facebook. They're, they're Facebook's fans, right? Yes, they are Facebook's fans. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to do something and um, spoon out information for people to figure it out. And um, uh, just to create a little excitement for our return to the stage. And then the following week, we actually have our first official gig. That's great, man. I'm excited to hear about how this all goes. I'm, ex yeah. I'm especially excited to hear about how your ears go. Cause you know, I've been obsessed about that lately. But, I know you, but, uh, you've been on the ride with me for the uh, well, that, That's it. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I'm definitely, I definitely feel vested in your success here, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't get to be there to help. So that's the trick, you know, um, it might, you know, one other thing and Brian mentioned this, I don't know, maybe Brian didn't, it was, um, I think it was Dave Dickinson, the, the sound guy at that Wally's gig. He said, I wish I had ears to plug in tonight to hear what you're hearing so I could help you. And I think Davis Thurston had said something earlier in the day about it too. But, but that idea that if someone else is mixing your ears for you, the best thing is for them to occasionally at least be able to plug in and yeah. hear your mix so that they can say, Oh my gosh, that's awful. And over time, they might be able to learn what your preferences are, but the difference between good and awful, uh, you know, could be, you know, especially if you give them a look like what's going on, they plug in, they're like, yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe I can, you know, dial this back or whatever. So yeah. that would, that maybe uh, would be a helpful thing for bill to, you know, occasionally just plug in and, and listen and think, hear what you're hearing. I think he does. I think okay. most of this comes down to my own sensitivity and, and comfort. Not that Bill has done anything, you know, made, made choices for me that I wouldn't want to make, but sure. um, I think it's just that combination. Like I said, it's a combination of things changing and sensitivity to that. Now a little skepticism that I'll ever get it right. And right. I get that in yeah, the yeah. back of your head, knowing what's out there once you come out of the cocoon, and wanting that, you know, that that's the thing. So that's that. the key. I think you got to get rid of the wedges, just remove yeah. the wedges, like, like yeah. get rid of the crutch. You, you know, you, you're never going to remember the lyrics if you're always reading them. Right. So, <laughs> it, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but like that kind of thing, because it has gotten to the point for me where I do not, I took an ear out last night just to, you know, just to see what it was like. It was like, oh, this is terrible. I can't hear <laughs> anything I want to hear. This is, it's so loud. Like it was a hugely, it was an amazing difference. And it's basically because for the last 18 months, I've had zero opportunities to play without in ears. Sure. And so I really have come to the other side of it where I mean, I definitely know what you're talking about when you say, oh, it sounds, you know, like this is what I'm used to. Well, now the ears are what I'm used to. And the idea of playing a gig without them, I, I, mm, I don't, hmm, no, no, no. I, I, I mean, I, <laughs> if, if it's one of these, you know, multi-band gigs and I sort of have to do it, I'll deal, but it won't be good. Like it'd be terrible for me now. So it's, you know, it, you got to just get yourself to that point. Of course, it took get it. 18 years, so it's, you know, that's a long road, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it was 18 years after playing for like seven years with earplugs. So like I was used to that detachment from things yep. around me. So, yeah. All right. All right. Now, is that all we got here? We could just Good. go on forever. All right, we folks. Could. Thank you for listening. It's been a blast. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Always be performing. Always. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We want to hear from you. What are your tricks? Let us know. <laughs> <laughs>